Hi, and welcome to the third video in this short course on an introduction to gifted education. In this video, I want to discuss how and why we should identify gifted students. Now, after a new cohort of students present themselves in class, it can take a little while before we come to know each individual child and how they will respond to the expectations we set of them. In a mixed ability classroom and in the absence of a program of differentiation, teachers tend to teach to the middle ability. This stretches the slightly weaker students, it matches the ability of average students well, but it often fails to challenge the academically stronger children. Now, while the NCCA recognises that good teaching for gifted children is good teaching for all children, this is not sufficient. The level at which a lesson is pitched is important. So in a mixed ability environment, the educational needs of gifted children are often neglected. This results in a negative experience of school. Gifted children will often complain of being bored more than is reasonable. And the younger the child, the greater the likelihood that this boredom will result in disruptive behaviour. Now, traditionally, the role of the teacher in the classroom was to deliver the curriculum and cognizance of the needs of children were very much secondary. The advent of child-centred education brought with it a recognition that children have a right to an appropriate education. This includes gifted children. However, the absence of specific teacher training at initial teacher education level often means that at best, teachers have no knowledge of gifted education matters and at worst, a heap of misconceptions about giftedness. Just as important as an appropriate educational provision within a school is, all children need an appropriate social experience of school. Because gifted children tend to have very different interests to other children, they often find it difficult to find a peer group in the school. This can lead to gifted children being isolated and often bullied in school. In a worst case scenario, it can lead to depression in gifted children. In a school of a thousand students, it's possible that 30 or so will be gifted. Now, these children could be dispersed across different classes and years, and so they'd have very few opportunities to meet each other. So it's important that the school tries to offer opportunities for gifted children to find their tribe. And notwithstanding these points, it's important to identify gifted children and provide for their educational needs because it's ethically the good thing to do. A school can't claim to be truly inclusive if it excludes anyone who is qualitatively different from the norm. Now, while schools are very busy places and it seems that every day the number of pressures increase, we can't ignore one section of the school community simply because it's convenient to do so. Schools have a duty of care towards all of their students. The effects of how we exercise this duty of care extends well into the adult life of the children we teach. So we have an ethical responsibility to ensure we do not exclude students for want of looking. There are several ways to identify gifted students, but we can break it down into two broad approaches. Objective measures based on tests such as IQ tests and subjective approaches such as observation by parents, peers and teachers. The Wechsler Intelligence Scale is a norm-referenced IQ test. It doesn't provide an absolute measure of intelligence. Instead, it ranks individuals against the sample that was used to construct the test. Because it's a ranked measure, a person with an IQ of 160 is not twice as smart as an individual with an IQ of 80. Now, the Wechsler test produces a score in which the mean or average IQ is 100. 68% of the population has an IQ that's plus or minus one standard deviation of this mean score. This means that 68% of the population has an IQ between 85 and 115. Schools on average cater best for these students. Approximately 14% have an IQ between 115 and 130. This group is referred to as mildly gifted. 2% of people have an IQ between 130 and 145, and this group is referred to as moderately gifted. The Wechsler scale originally had a ceiling or a maximum measure of 160. So a number of years ago, a set of extended norms were produced in conjunction with the National Association for Gifted Children in the United States, and this allowed for IQ assessments up to 210. So between 145 and 159 IQ points, uh, we have the highly gifted, and these represent somewhere between 1 in 1,000 and 1 in 10,000 individuals. Between 160 and 179 IQ points, there are the exceptionally gifted, and they represent roughly 1 in 10,000 
up to about one in a million individuals. So it's very rare indeed. And the rarest are the profoundly gifted who have an IQ of 180 plus, and they literally are fewer than one in a million. Below an IQ of 85, children need specialist intervention in school, or in some cases, access to a special school in order to achieve. It sounds counterintuitive, but the further above an IQ of 130, the greater the need for specialist intervention to ensure gifted children receive an appropriate education. While there's much debate about the negative aspects of IQ tests, they are amongst the most studied and tested measures of psychological characteristics. Most of the debate about IQ focuses on the measures reported by the IQ test rather than on the environmental causes for the reported measures. That said, Robert Sternberg affirms that IQ predicts school performance moderately well and that IQ correlates very well with life performance, predicting health, longevity and job success. John Hattie in New Zealand states that IQ predicts performance in job training and that it's amongst the best predictors of earnings potential. Another test of IQ is Raven's progressive matrices. This test consists of an image of a pattern in which a piece is missing. The test taker has to decide which jigsaw piece correctly completes the pattern. Raven's progressive matrices doesn't suffer from the same environmental issues as the Weschler scale, and therefore it's a much more reliable measure of IQ, especially for individuals with strong visual spatial abilities. However, Raven's progressive matrices also suffers from ceiling effects and it tops out at an IQ of 135, and so it can't be used to identify exceptionally or profoundly gifted individuals. One way of addressing the ceiling effects of IQ tests is to use above-level tests such as scholastic achievement tests. SATs are used by the Centre for Talented Youth. College entry SATs that are designed for 18-year-old students are administered to students aged 12 to 16 to determine their qualification for entry into CTYI's courses. Any 12 to 16-year-old student scoring in the 95th percentile in such an SAT is obviously gifted. Subjective means of identification include observation by parents, teachers and peers. Parent observations are particularly accurate when compared to other siblings in the family. Teacher observation is a powerful tool in identifying children who are gifted, not just in one domain, but children who may be gifted in different domains. Students are also very accurate in their identification of gifted students. Of course, a teacher would not ask this question directly in class, but might instead provide students with a questionnaire asking who's the funniest student in the class or which student would you first ask for help with schoolwork. Below this video there are a number of links which will provide you with a series of observation forms which you can use in several subjects or which you can share with colleagues. The lists are not exhaustive and they shouldn't be used on their own but rather in conjunction with other identification procedures. There is a general checklist for primary school a general checklist for secondary schools and an Excel file with checklists for several subjects. Some of these have been adapted from the NCCA guidelines for teachers of exceptionally able students and they also include reference to my own experience teaching gifted children. There's some debate over whether or not a child should be told they're gifted. In the absence of an IQ test there are some very obvious and clear reasons why you should not do so, not least because of the possibility of being wrong. Different children will handle the news that they are gifted in different ways. Research by Carl Dweck suggests that children who are praised for being smart do not perform as well as children who are praised for the effort that they make. However, there are times when telling a child they are gifted can help them come to an understanding of their experiences in school. This is particularly important where a child has been diagnosed with depression that results from their experience of being gifted. Being told they are gifted is a way in which they can come to understand that there's nothing wrong with them and that it's just they are different. In America, where some states and school districts have funding specifically for gifted education programs, or where there are dedicated schools for gifted children, it's impossible to avoid telling a child who has sat an entrance exam and passed that they are gifted. What's important is that every child needs and deserves every encouragement they can get in life. However, it's important that gifted children realise that a gifted assessment doesn't mean that they no longer need to make an effort. This is important because gifted students will sometimes avoid making an effort in order to avoid failing. The risk of failing becomes equated with not being gifted after all. So the decision whether or not to tell a student they are gifted should be one for parents to make in the knowledge that the parents may have to adapt their parenting style 
as a consequence of this news. There's one additional group of gifted students which require particular intervention from teachers. Twice exceptional students are students who are gifted but who also have a learning disability. For example, a child may be gifted and also dyslexic. In this situation, the child's giftedness can mask the dyslexia so that the giftedness helps compensate for the learning disability. Alternatively, the teacher may see the dyslexia but not see the giftedness. A teacher might reflect on this when they consider their personal experience of a student's excellent performance in class but apparently poor homework or assignment effort. Typical school report comments such as must work harder suggest that the teacher believes the child has more ability than their work displays. So the question has to be why did the student not produce work which is commensurate with their perceived ability? Of particular concern are gifted students who are also on the autistic spectrum. These students present a particular challenge and require specific intervention to help them make the most of their strengths. Now, noting the similarities between gifted behaviours and those of ADHD and Asperger's syndrome, a psychologist in the United States, Dr. James Webb, expresses concern about the misdiagnosis of children who are gifted. It's important that any psychological assessment considers gifted traits so that they're not mistaken for another condition. All things held constant, this is particularly important where a child's in-school behaviour prompts a call for an assessment. In the absence of IQ tests and observational data, some schools have relied on school examination data to identify gifted children. While this can be useful in identifying gifted children, it's important that it's not relied on too heavily. Some gifted children, in particular those who are twice exceptional, may perform poorly on written tests. In addition, it's the high achievers rather than the gifted who are more likely to perform well in school tests. Consequently, teachers and parent observation is an important tool in accurately identifying gifted children. In summary, any assessment of whether a child is gifted should take account of several sources of data and shouldn't rely on one measure. IQ tests are important, but so too are parent and teacher observation. In the next video, we will look at characteristics of gifted children to get a better understanding of them.